Hey, our uh, guest in this segment is the Vice Chair of Finance Delegate John Hardy. Mr. Hardy, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, good morning. I'm sure if we could talk Bill into jumping out of that plane, we could come up with a financing to pay for it. I, I think <laughs> we can. <laughs> Hold a second. I think we'd have bipartisan <laughs> support, John. <laughs> yeah, I think his wife would be the first one to kick in, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, John, uh, Mike. Don't be, don't be trying to change the subject, <laughs> Bill. He's just moving on, isn't he? Yeah, now I'm going to shift we got momentum going here. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm afraid. Uh, Mike was telling us how... Uh, how little he did during interims, wasting our taxpayer money, sitting in Charleston, just having a great time. Uh, went to a couple of committee said. meetings. But did you find it any more productive? Well, I found it non-productive at all because I didn't go. So. <laughs> oh, didn't. So, and, and I'll tell you this, Bill. I went into finance, yeah. and, and the chairman of finance, yeah. Vern Chris, who you know is you, the most scary person down there, yeah was actually very nice, cheery. And I asked him, I said, w why are you so happy? It was, John's not here yelling at me and telling me. Because <laughs> the, the person you see here is not the same person that you see oh. in Charleston. He's known as the dream killer in Charleston, right? Well, he's just a different man. Uh, and his role there is different. And uh, I can say safely, I've been friends with John for a long yeah. time. Um, I sit next to him. I was joking with him. I, I was like, hey, you sign on my bill. I, th I thought I had a shoe in. You mean this hey. this nice guy, the one that everybody loves and he, views as he, nice and cuddly? He looked, and warm. He, he looked at me about two, two three weeks in the session because I'd been hounding him every day about my small business, uh, Bill. And he just looked back. He says, yeah, Mike, it's dead. It's not in the plans. <laughs> I was like, what, what do you mean? You, you signed on. He goes, I know. I know. It's just not in the plans. Well, then he just turned around. I was like... What is going on here? Well, I, I learned that from the best. I learned that from Eric Householder. Householder would sign on to your bills, and, and uh, you know, you'd feel confident. Yeah. Like, yeah. I got the finance chairman yeah. signing on my bills, and he, he had no problem just, you know, <laughs> slitting our throats and throwing them to the side. So, but, and, uh, and, you, and, I, and you want me to jump out of an airplane? Right, right. You know, and that's that's the role of uh, finance. That's the role of the, of the vice chair of finance is, is to run a little defense for the, uh, the chairman. The chairman is uh, completely overwhelmed and bombarded by not only other members, but also uh, by agencies uh, and, and also lobbyists who represent different organizations and agencies. So it's my job to run a little defense. And, you know, we, we actually will kill way more bills than we will ever take up in finance. And that's kind of our role. Um, some of our other... Uh, uh, committees will pass bills. Uh, sometimes, I, I, to my dismay, I, I think that those committees, as the education committee, as I like to call it, the, <laughs> the, 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 the spin committee, they, they, uh, they spend a lot of money. Uh, and it's our job in the finance to, to kind of keep that committee in check and keep the, the spending in check. So we, we will, every Monday uh, before floor session, we will, uh, or after floor session, we will do what we call bill book, and we'll go through a book that has all of the bills sure, that are coming. We, to, we've been the finance committee? It would be the finance okay, committee. Okay, so yeah. it would be uh, the chair chairman, myself, uh, um, the, all of our budget analysts, and our staff. Yeah. Uh, and um, so we would go through that, and we would look at what pieces of legislation we wanted to run, uh, what was in uh, the purview of that year's budget, and, and how we were trying to uh, set the budget up for that year. So that's just kind of what our job is to do. So, And Mike, Mike is, true, is, is true. I mean, we do kill a lot of bills. And my, my, my personality is a bit different in Charleston, but you know, that's just kind of what I have but, to do. But he, he will also defend bills um, that – that he's going through. I, I will give John. I, I remember one line he had on the floor where he he, he said he looked back. At, at, I don't know who it was. Well, I do, but I'm not going to mention who it was. Uh, and he said the line, "I will caution the gentleman." And it was basically like a, "Hey, sit down, little boy. You don't know what you're talking about here." And, and he does a lot of research on all the things he's defending. So he had to defend. All of the bills, or in fact, most of the bills, I think you were, you were assigned to defend. I, I did do a lot of the yeah. floor work, and and the, the chairman was gracious enough to let me do that. I like to do floor work, and and uh, and the chairman was very busy working on the uh, budget and dealing with the agencies and dealing with the Senate. So, uh, uh, Chairman uh, Chris was very kind to me and, and let me do, and let me be very involved in the budget process. John, earlier this morning, uh, Mike was talking about the school safety spending. Uh, Sheriff Nate Harmon called in about hardening the schools getting SROs for each school and the cost that they would be involved in that. And this obviously has to come partly from the state legislature, partly from uh, local counties and boards of education. What could the state's role in this be? And is there any idea at this 
time along the way? What it would take to harden schools across the state and provide security? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, Rob, I, I don't know, you know, what my future is and, or how, where, how much longer I'll be in the legislature or what my path is. But I will tell you that my number one goal uh, in before I leave the legislature is to be able to have some type of funding source or funding formula for our SROs. I believe that the SROs are the most important thing that we can have in the schools. I don't think that we're going to get to a point to where we're going to be able to have one in every school, but I do like uh, the sheriff's, Nate Harmon's, plan to have uh, roving SROs. We're starting to build these educational complexes now. Um, so I think that it's probably going to be a makeup of, uh, I've, I've had a conversation with Delegate Hornby and with um, uh, the chairman of education um, uh, and also with the sheriff are talking about maybe having it be part of the uh, per pupil funding formula. Yeah. If we go back in and look at the funding formula that comes to the counties from the state, that the um, just make that part of the funding formula. It could not be that much money per student. Um, so that would be a route. I think there's also probably some thought processes of making – uh, there be a funding formula where the local board of education, the state legislature, and the uh, local county commission uh, would all have a little skin in the game, and we could kind of break that up uh, throughout uh, those three organizations. You know, ultimately the taxpayer is going to pay for this. That's yeah. exactly who's going to pay for this. But I think if you would pose the question uh, to the general taxpayer that if you know they were able to pay a couple dollars more a year uh, in, in taxes to secure our schools and make sure that we had uh, uh, school resource officers, which which work in many different ways in the in the schools. Not only are they just there as a protection force, but they're also there. They head off a lot of problems at the schools before they grow. Uh, the students typically will build a relationship with them, feel very comfortable with them, and and can go and talk with them about issues uh, before they they snowball into a giant issue. You you kind of uh, addressed the point I was going to ask. The SROs are they viewed as a deterrent? or as a the capability of responding if there was say, an active shooter because so many of these active shooters are suicidal so i do i question whether or not they would the sro would be a deterrent i do think i think they would be a deterrent and i think they would be an active uh play an active role if there was an active yeah. shooter because mm -hmm. you know we we've seen in some of these last instances where uh you know people have decided to not go to a certain school because there was a security presence presence or there was a uh, police presence there. Um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in gun that get gun free zones are the are the problems. If you go to an area that no one is allowed to uh, protect themselves and there no one there to protect them, then you're opening up this this problem. So uh, I, I do believe that uh, if we're not going to give people the ability to protect themselves, then there then we must supply them with the protections that they need. Uh, most of our you know, if you go to any of our court systems or any of our legal buildings and, uh, you know, those places, they're, they're hardened and they also have security. I think that we need to start to look and try to find uh, ways to do this for our education. I mean, I, I, I told someone, the other night, I was having this conversation with Roger Hanshaw uh, last night, and I said, there's not a lot of things that keep me awake at night, but this is one thing that I am very, very concerned about. And uh, hopefully that I can play a small role in that in trying to figure this problem out. And I think an SRO, too, would really help. Uh, find that problem before it becomes a problem. That's the point. Yeah, and that, yeah. that's that's the really the, the yeah. key thing because we just West Virginia. We don't want to be the next statistic. Yeah. Uh, and, and now, how do you view the SRO and the Guardian program? Are that just highly complementary, or one you uh, you fund in lieu of the other, or what? Well, I you know I I'm a very uh, very supportive of the SROs. I think the SROs is is the direction that I would like to go. Um, you know, there's been some legislation for arming school teachers. Um, you know, I think that is is a uh, route that should be um, investigated and maybe looked into. I think that's probably something that'd be one of our last choices to make. I'm not saying that I wouldn't support that, but I'm saying I, I really support having someone who is a police officer, who has made the commitment to be a police officer, who is trained as a police officer, uh, also uh, also uh, is trained in being able to recognize um, situations maybe before they reach their um, uh, the precipice and, and something large happens. So it, it would be my purview to be able to try to get as much as many um, resource officers in the schools as we possibly could and use that program and utilize it to its uh, fullest amount. Delegate John Hardy, our guest here on the program, he is the vice chair of 
finance. And John, you said before your time is done in Charleston, you would like to make sure that this happens. What's a reasonable time frame to expect something like this to actually hit the ground and get implemented? I, I hope and pray that we come up with something next session. I, th- I think that this is yeah. the time for us to be working on this through uh, our interim processes uh, to be able to study, look at the finances of this. And I think that it's time to act now, uh, act boldly. I believe that, uh, you know, we, we go to Charleston, uh, myself and Delegate Hornby and Delegate Height and, and and Householder and and and, and Delegate Espinosa and all. we go to Charleston um, to to fight and to make bold changes. We, we it's a you know and I'm not tooting my own horn, but it's a sacrifice for the time that we spend away and the travel that we that we do. And we don't have much of a life that you know when we're down there working and we work. And I think it's time to act. It's time to act now and it's time to act boldly. Uh, and I think that we need to make the financial um, decision and make the uh, financial choice that we are going to come up with a way to fund these uh, school resource officers. Like I said, whether that would be, you know, not completely on the, the legislature, but maybe working with local counties, uh, uh, with the county commissioners, and also with the local school boards. Would the education committee have the lead on this? I believe... I, I think it would start. It would start there, uh, Bill. I think uh, there's there's appetite for this. I think, like John says, if not now, when uh, yeah. this is the time to do it. We we just passed the start t- tax cuts. We we're we're in that position now to to work with. Obviously, finance is going to have. If there's money involved, finance would probably be second reference to finance. But I, I think we've got to come up with the plan during now during interims well let me ask well you've got a a estimated 1.7 billion dollar budget surplus that you're going to have as we get to the end of uh, june here this year so july 1 you start a new fiscal year correct Yes, and then by then you should be about 1.7 billion plus. Yes, and there is uh, things. There, there how are, much of that is committed already to backfills? You know, I knew you were going to ask me that, and I can't remember. But a good part of it has already yeah. been committed. Roughly, 400 million. I think 800 million. No, I think 1.3. 1. 1. Yeah, like 1.3 billion has already been set aside for uh, pro- things in the back of the budget. Okay, so, so you get about 400 million of that. that yeah, would and, be I, and and I think investable. Right, and I think well, if we if we look at it as a multifunctional type of financing, uh, we know that our local that our local board of education, you know, they they have a very large budget. Uh, I believe that our county commission, our county council, soon to be county commission. Thank you, John Hardy. I passed. That <laughs> but uh, soon, soon to be that they're going to be, you know, they're they're going to have skin in the game, and then the state, the legislature can have some skin in the game. Yeah. So, um, I really think it's going to take a concerted effort. But I think that it is time to to do this now. I want to move on to another topic here, real quick, uh, because we did a program yesterday on the Day Report Center. Yes. By the way, which was uh, awesome. Uh, the guest that we had on was great, very knowledgeable. You sent me a text during that interview. The legislature must act to make circuit judges recognize these drug courts and day report centers as legal alternative programs. Some counties will not use these or recognize them as a legal alternative. Is that a handful of counties in the state, John? Is it the majority of the counties? There are a few circuits that are in the um, uh, middle of West Virginia and southern West Virginia where, uh, you know, those pr- those programs, um, and I did misspeak a little bit, they, they are completely legal, so it is legal to use them, but those programs only work as well as the, bo- the local buy-in. So we are lucky here that our judges and our prosecutor, uh, uh, Matt Harvey in Jefferson County, and Kelly uh, Wilkes Delegati from Berkeley, yeah, Katie. Yeah. They, they are very bought in. They understand that they work. They work with the court systems, uh, and they make the systems work. I think that it's very important for the taxpayers not to be paying for people to sit in jail uh, that can be on home confinement, that can be – we're looking to be rehabilitated people that have con- – that have um, – uh, been convicted of minor crimes, minor crimes. But we have some counties and some circuits that will not recognize these drug courts and day report centers, do not want to use them. The judges don't respect them. The judges don't want to be involved with them. Uh, therefore, the prosecutors are not really engaged with them. So I think as a legislature, we need to uh, enact some type of legislation that says, you know, on behalf of the taxpayers, to save the taxpayers and the county commissions on their jail bills, that these counties must. Uh, uh, work in some fashion to form uh, day report centers, drug courts, home confinements to be able to uh, save the taxpayers uh, and the counties on their jail bills. 
Yeah, you, you made a key point a second ago, John, that all parties have to be bought in. That includes the prosecuting attorney, the judicial system, the sh- sheriff, and the like. We had a situation in Berkeley County, and uh, the day reporting center in Berkeley County has been going off and on since uh, uh, 2010, and then it fell out of, it stopped functioning for a while. But in one of those times, the uh, the judge, a couple of judges would not sentence anybody to day reporting center because they were unhappy the way the sheriff was utilizing the uh, the individuals. They were being used for personal projects and, and not for community service. So it's important that all parties are bought into it. And again, you mentioned Katie Delegati, uh, very supportive. That has not always been the case here. No, it hasn't. So, uh, so I, I guess I'd hesitate to point, you, you mentioned ju- the judges. Uh, they're a key part, but they're not the only part. No, but what's been brought to my attention is in, in a few of the circuits, the judges are just don't want. They don't have they're any buy-in. They're just yeah. Yeah, they're not they're yeah. they're just not interested in participating. They haven't seen the them. positive impact in their community. Well, and and the thing is, you know, and and it's really easy to you know to be mad at these people that have these drug issues and, and are causing some of the problems in our society. But you know, I've been to a few of these graduations where these people have you know finished their drug re- re- rehabilitation and have went through the drug courts and went through the rehabilitation programs that are offered and i've seen these people get their lives back i've seen what it's done to them what it's done to their family members their mom and dad their parents i mean it's a pretty powerful thing to watch one of these people get their lives back it's a wonderful program uh but how would you uh legislate uh getting these these counties that are resistant how would you legislate getting them involved well bill we're the legislature we can do anything we want uh, well yeah <laughs> yeah we, we know that yeah yeah i'm sure I'm we've sure, all experienced sure that, so. i'm sure we would come up with some type of uh, would it be a monetary i don't know and that there may be that may be a way to to get some you know say hey maybe the uh legislature is going to pick up a portion of your jail bill of your of your you know your county's jail bill if you have these in in place and that's how this conversation got started because we were talking about the jail bills and I had this conversation with the speaker Roger Hanshaw and that's how this whole conversation got started I had a long lengthy conversation with him last night and uh, talking about a multitude of things but that's how the conversation got started I said you know if, if the if the these counties want us to pick the state to pick up some of the jail bill which I think the state maybe does have some skin in that game um, long term long out maybe not the first five Five days or 10 days, but out, you know, the, the out days, um, then the legislature needs to implement that they will have these drug courts and these day report centers and home confinements. And so to make sure if the state is going to pick up the the bill for the jail bills, then there's really no uh, nothing driving the counties to kind of yeah. control that cost. So those that way, are, the way they, they play by the rules. Sure. You know, sure. If, you, if you're going to put state funding in there, they go. Yeah. yeah if there's so. if there's a monetary uh, uh Benefit. push or reason benefit either in positive or negative i can see that uh, i guess i have a little uh, uh question whether or not the legislators get into the domain of the judi- judicial side and the like these are three separate parts of a government so yeah well we get involved in the judicial side all the time with uh you know uh, working with them on their realignments and their circuits, the magistrates, moving magistrates. Well, we didn't really move any around. We just created more, uh, which, uh, you know, but Berkeley County got what it needed and Jefferson County mm-hmm. is getting another magistrate. And so we do interact with the judicial system and it is, you know, the legislature's purview to be able to try to make, um, uh, counties and, and state agencies and state systems work as taxpayer friendly as possible. Delegate John Hardy, our guest here on the program a week ago uh, today. In fact, we did a show with Jim Wallet, the executive director of the Public Water uh, Service District here in Berkeley County. And at that point, you had sent me a text saying the legislature has infused $422 million into the Water Development Authority and IJDC. Yes. Yeah, so um, last session, in the 2022 session, we put uh, $250 million into the WDA, which is the Water Development Authority, which works very closely with the IJDC, which is the uh, Infrastructure's Jobs and Development Council. And I actually sit on that council. I was appointed to that by the governor. I am the House's liaison to that organization and work pretty closely with them. Um, and then this past session, we infused another $177 million into that. Uh, I've been able to work with the IJDC and the WDA, uh, w- along with some of my other local legislators, um, to secure about $26 million in grants uh, for um 
water development. Uh, we're going to take the river plant from 6 million to 10 million gallons a day. That was one of the projects. Uh, we are implementing some new water mains in the South Berkeley area um, to get some more water flowing to the South Berkeley area. That was another one of the projects. There is another estimated $25 million in grants uh, that is coming to Berkeley County for the upgrade of the uh, water treatment plant in South Berkeley. Uh, and then um, uh, there is also the uh, county has taken on um, uh, quite a bit of some loans and some they're going to sell some bonds to be able to, to finance these uh, projects. So uh, there's been a lot of movement in the uh, water development and the infrastructure in Berkeley County of getting more water. Um, uh, we haven't really addressed too much in, in our uh, sewer service. I think we have still pretty good, you know, we just redid all of our sewer plants about 10 years ago. And I think we still have pretty good capacity in our sewer plants, but we were really lacking on the, uh, the amount of water that we could move around the, the county. Yeah, as you may have heard, uh, uh, when we had the drought back in 2002, 2003, uh, we were within one day of running out of water in South Berkeley. That has been corrected through the combination of upgrade of the river plant and distribution lines running north and south. Yeah, we've been able to greatly uh, uh, raise the amount of water that we take from yeah. the Potomac and move it all the way to South Berkeley. Yeah. So so that's that's been a, a good enhancement. And with some of the other... Uh, companies coming to town in the water usage and and also i think there's some ability for us to probably use some of the city of martinsburg's water because they do not utilize all the water that they produce and so uh you know the county kind of has them i would say kind of landlocked so there's where there's probably a, an ability for the county to utilize some of the city's water too well they do they utilize i think a thousand gallons a day they have access to a million a million sorry okay you're right but there's one question about that and uh and i don't i don't know if it's been resolved or not but there's all there's been thought in the past there's excess capacity in the the city's water then i've heard it's all a recycling uh combination so less water available than what they initially thought uh unless you have severe drought it's, it's immaterial sure but in severe drought it could be a factor well water is key i mean water is key, key. Water so is key. john have you uh Jefferson County, obviously, that utility is being taken over by a private entity. Yes. Uh, have you heard any rumblings or talks from American Water w with Berkeley County? There, there has been some. Uh, there has been some talks about American Water, um, you know, maybe trying to venture into Berkeley County Water uh, PSD. Uh, you know, it's. It's not something that's very well known. It's right. uh, it's just been there's been some back ch you know talking in some back channels and uh, uh, I know enough about it to be dangerous. I can tell you the the amount that I do know about it right now is I'm not a fan of it. Okay, yeah. uh, you are talking about a private entity, a for profit uh, uh, corporation that has uh, stockholders that they have to answer to, and I would worry uh, about our rate payers down the road. Uh, I think that. Uh, um, down the road that the the, the rate but we payer. just raise rates correct well there's a, there's pay, a, there's a these bonds there's a process <laughs> in raising the rates because right. um, through the process of upgrading the water systems and selling the bonds the bonds you have to be able to generate a certain amount of revenue to be able to uh, have a uh, uh, generated or a dedicated revenue stream yeah. for those bonds so to be able to make uh, the bond company's happy, the rates are going to have to be raised, uh, and that'll have to go through the uh, PSC for to get permission of that. Yeah, Mike, uh, American Water has been trying to get into Berkeley County for at least the last 20 yeah. years, and there's been absolutely no interest on the part of the, the water county. district yeah. uh, of getting involved. Yeah. If they have to go to the, the PSD to get, uh, or PSC to get a rate hike increase, what difference does it make if it's privately owned or not? That would be my question. Uh, you know, if Electricity is privately owned. Waste management is privately owned. There's a, there's a lot of privately owned uh, utilities. There is, but I will tell you. In your, uh, but I'm not advocating for either one. I'm right. just, I just heard rumblings that, that right. American Water well, was. Well, your public service your your yeah. public service commissions are usually not profitable. They're, right. they're typically not a profitable. You know, they're just a service. And yeah. uh, you know, when you start getting a, a for profit company coming in and yeah. that's controlling the water, uh, you know, I, I can tell you, I, I was involved in one meeting with it, and I was pretty vocal at that okay. meeting. I believe you were at that meeting, or maybe, maybe you weren't. I was not. His, yes. Historically, it was a public service commission, but that has been shifted now to the county council. Yes. So the public service commission has no involvement at all now on rate increases. So are you saying that, uh, and I know you're not indicting anybody in particular here, Bill, but because those are elected positions, a private company could make campaign contributions to help rate increases go through? 
anything's possible. I doubt it. I doubt if that would ever ever happen. But, but they the can't. Big, they can't be held accountable if they're. they're but they're elected, but so. the big thing, you're you're kind of shifting me down a different path. Uh, the big I'll, thing. I'll do that sometimes. Yeah, I know you do, and you're, you're very, up in a plane you're, too. You're very successful. Yeah, <laughs> but the uh, the fact that the uh, the legislators have moved that decision making from a body in Charleston to a local entity was probably the, one of the best things I've ever done. Public Service Commission did not have an appreciation for a growing county such as the Northern Panel or the Eastern Panel. They saw these little small counties that were that were having a different sort of problems. So getting the Public Service Commission attention and getting any sympathy from them was difficult. It's so much better now that everything shifted to the county council. Said, said like a true past county commissioner that didn't have to and, vote on these. And, and also, yeah, and also uh, uh, president of the water district for several years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I can see it from both sides. Well, I, I do believe it does put pressure. It does put a lot more pressure on your local county commissioners because they ultimately will have to be the ones that takes the vote to the race the water rates yeah. uh, but you know listen being a county commissioner is a tough job you make tough decisions all yeah. the time and you make those decisions I, I i say all the time you know uh in charleston we're a little more insulated from some of the decisions that we make uh when you're a county commissioner you make those local decisions that affect local people and you you know sometimes in the grocery store it's uh it's tough hey, that let, commissioner let, job pays a lot better than that delegate job <laughs> that's right let me sh uh go back to the uh, water district very quickly uh and i'm going to give uh credit to Greg Rowe. Greg's been president of the chairman of the water district about 15 years now. Uh, you will not find problems in the uh, Berkeley County Water District of not being able to meet the demands unless something catastrophic happens. These guys are constantly looking down the road and planning what they need to do to be sure to keep up with the They program. do a very good job of not getting out over their skis. They understand yeah. the water yeah. that they have and yeah. how they can provide it. Yeah. And I've, I've uh, um, Build a great relationship with Jim Ol is Oliet. Yeah, Oliet. Oliet. Yeah. Oliet. Wallet. Yeah. Wallet. Wallet. Yeah. So I've I've built a great relationship with him, and he's very engaged. And he's they a, are. Yeah. He's, yeah he, I, I work with him quite often through the IJDC and the WDA yeah. with Marie Prezioso. Good people. I like that name. Hey, uh, were you a Boy Scout? In yes, I was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's the highest you made? Life. I didn't make it to Eagle. I made it to Life Scout. Life Scout. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I, I turned. Uh, 15 and i got interested in cars and girls and boy scouts was done, so. that'll happen <laughs> yeah uh john elliott is our next guest boy scouts of america here locally would you like to stay i'd love to well hang out we'll make it a party here as uh, we take our break here 